Good evening, everybody. I'm here with President Mark Dimenstein of the American Postal Workers Union, and he's going to be speaking with us more in depth about the postal service response to the coronavirus epidemic. President Mark, do you want to share some things with our viewers? Certainly. And first, uh, good evening or afternoon, uh, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, and all our good members and a uh, number of friends who have joined in for this uh, live stream. This is a first for us, uh, another effort to try to communicate in every possible way uh, with, with the members. We will have an informal conversation. We'll have a chance for some questions and answers. Uh, and we'll share time with you for about an hour. Uh, first, I want to uh, hope that everybody's safe and healthy, the best we can be in these trying and challenging times. Uh, for those who have been uh, sickened, uh, for those who have lost co-workers and family members, I lost a family member myself to this terrible disease. Our hearts and our thoughts, the American Postal Workers Union certainly goes out to all of you. Uh, I wanted to talk about three main issues facing the postal workers and postal service. And I'll tell you up front with me uh, this evening is Brother Vance Zimmerman, our Industrial Relations Director that later in the program will give you an update on the health and safety fight as industrial relations director. He leads uh, that effort at the national level and uh, uh, hasn't had much sleep for the last two months with all the efforts there and he'll give you a report on that. And our legislative and political director, uh, Judy Beard, to bring you an update on some of the issues in Congress that are moving forward. Uh, and they're critical issues for us. So, so there's three basic uh, issues going on that I think we have to be uh, very aware of. And don't forget, this is all in the context that the union's functioning, we're moving on, we're proud to be postal workers, we're proud to be union. Uh, we just got a long fought for pay raise on May 1st, retroactive pay uh, will, will be granted towards the end of the uh, August, early September. Uh, Thousands of PSCs have been converted under our new contract. Uh, the new contract is in the mail, should be arriving to your home shortly. So while we're very focused on the pandemic, the life of the union that you make happen uh, by being dedicated members is going on. Three things. First of all, a huge salute to all of you as frontline workers, essential workers, Binding the country together as we do in normal times, mission of the post office, but in this time of crisis, have really stepped up to the plate under very challenging and dangerous circumstances. I think the people of the country greatly appreciate uh, what we're all doing, and certainly your union leaders uh, are in awe of the uh, pride that all of you have shown uh, in serving the people of this country. So it's definitely been a health and safety crisis, uh, not just for us, but uh, many other frontline workers, essential workers, uh, the healthcare workers have been awesome. Transit drivers, truck drivers, meat packers, grocery store workers, our hats off to all of the people and the workers that are making the world go around. Um, alone for now, because brother Zimmerman will go into that in more detail, but that's, one of the three things affecting us very deeply, and we've worked very hard to uh, ensure the best possible health and safety for the, for the postal workers under these circumstances. What I wanna mainly focus on is the economic and political crisis that has followed the pandemic. And it's very, very serious and it's dire. So we know that the pandemic has caused a deep economic crisis the world over. We know it's caused a deep economic crisis in the United States. We have 30 million of our friends and neighbors and family members that have found themselves unemployed almost overnight. We have depression levels. I'm talking about the 1929, 1930 depression levels of unemployment and a contracting economy. And the impact of this economic crisis is no different uh, on the Postal Service. And here's what's basically happening. You all know, most of your neighbors probably don't. You know that the post office does not run on taxpayer money. It runs on the revenue from postage, post 
postal products, postal services. And that revenue has to enable the postal service and us as the workers that make it go around to accomplish our mission. Universal service mandate, every address, no matter who we are, no matter where we live, uniform rates, not fees for how long, how far something goes, not fees if it's in a remote area or in an inner city area. 160 million addresses, six days a week. And what's happened, and I'm sure you know this because you're in the plants, you're in the retail units, you're on the front lines. Mail has precipitously dropped. What advertiser is advertising right now? What restaurant sending coupons? What retailer is saying, come shop at my store when so much is shut down and we're shuttered in place? Grandpa like me, couldn't go out and buy my granddaughter who had her birthday on April 13th, the birthday card, so I never sent it first class mail and she never got it delivered first class mail. Now, there has been an uptick in packages. You all know that by being in, on the front lines. Uh, but that's not going to last, and it doesn't make up for the loss of mail. And it, it's up. People are shuttered in place. But quite frankly, with 30 million and more unemployed, how much money are people going to have to order online? Once people start going out and shopping again, that's going to change. So that can't be a long-run solution to the economic crisis. And so if we just look at COVID and leave aside some of the other challenges we've been working on, like how to get rid of this onerous 2006 pre-funding of, of a future retiree health costs, which was moving its way through Congress to repeal it. And we were making great progress on a bipartisan basis. That's all been frozen right now. What we're really looking right now is relief on the, from the impact of the COVID pandemic. And so the Postal Service has done modeling, some of it's guesswork, because it depends what happens with packages and so on, that without relief, without financial relief, the post office could literally run out of money late summer or early fall. And I don't have to tell you what happens if the, our national treasure runs out of money. The whole question of whether the doors will be shut, the whole question of whether service ceases, or the whole question of whether it gets so diminished that it's stuck into a little bottle and nobody knows we're even there anymore. One or two day a week delivery, closing post offices, closing more processing plants, slowing down the mail. So this is the dire economic situation. Now, along with the economic situation, then comes the political situation. It's how do we get relief? Uh, we had a stimulus package in Congress at the end of March, $2.2 trillion. Sisters and brothers, I lose zeros. I was on a radio show today and said 2.2 million because you get lost in how, a, a, a billion when it's trillion. And in that effort, the House of Representatives had a proposal for $25 billion of pure relief to the Postal Service. Keep in mind, that $500 billion went to the corporations and they got all sorts of grants and economic relief. And even on the Senate side, so the House is Democratic control, the Senate's Republican control, and they had serious money, some 13 or $14 billion of pure relief to the Postal Service. So what happened? Logically, we're all sitting here, would say, well, if the Senate wanted one thing and the House wanted another, then you meet them halfway and we have $20 billion, at least for the COVID revenue loss in this moment. Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin, who comes straight out of Wall Street, and Goldman Sachs, ordered, gave Congress an ultimatum. If postal relief is in this bill, you won't have an incentive package at all. And unfortunately, our supporters, and we have lots of supporters in Congress on both sides of the aisle, did not raise this issue prior to a priority level where they flipped the script on Mnuchin and this administration and say, well, guess what? If the people in this country are not taken care of with their invaluable postal services and their small d democratic right to these services, then you won't have an incentive package. And we ended up with nothing.
Actually, we ended up with worse than nothing. We ended up with an additional ability to borrow, we meaning the Postal Service, $10 billion with whatever strings attached the Treasury Department wants to make. More debt doesn't help the post office sisters and brothers. It just puts the post office in a deeper hole. The post office isn't set up to make money. It's not set up to pack away billions of dollars. It's not set up to enrich shareholders and, and enrich CEOs. It's set up to serve the people of the country on a break-even basis. We, I, we had a second huge stimulus package. They called it 3.5, another $500 billion. Postal relief was absent. We now have a new attempt, at least coming from the House of Representatives that Sister Judy Beard will speak on later, uh, where the Postal Service is again included this time. Now it's got to make its way through Congress. So we really wanted to impress upon all of you how dire the situation is, how real the situation is. And I personally think it's shameful, and most of you who know me and have read my articles, heard me speak, I don't throw off on any one political party or every any one individual. But all of us, whether we support this administration, whether we oppose this administration, whoever we voted for, all of us deeply believe in, our, in the service, in the institution, in the public good we are part of. And certainly we believe in our union, our good jobs, and our future job security. So I think it's absolutely shameful that those who want to privatize and sell off this post office to private corporations are using this economic crisis of the pandemic, especially at a time that you're on the front lines with all the danger and all the legitimate fears and concerns we had, would call you a joke. Would tell the people, that tell the workers, 61 postal workers have died. COVID. Thousands have tested positive. Tens of more than 10,000 have been quarantined. You know it's no joke. And the people of the country getting medicines from you, getting medical information from you, getting stimulus checks from you, getting retirement checks from you, getting Mother's Day cards from you, where we were able to get out and buy them or still had them in the house, getting census information, getting balloting information. The, the people of this country know that the Postal Service is no joke. And let me just end with this, and we'll probably talk about it more, because I don't want to go on too long, because I'd rather hear from you, and we can have a much of a give and take over this technology as we can. The people of this country do not look at the Postal Service as a partisan issue. It's nonpartisan. It's beloved. It's trusted. It's needed. Pew Research has a poll every year where they, they, they rate the, the federal agencies. The Postal Service always rates the highest. This year, they rated the highest ever. And I think it's because the public so much appreciates that window clerk out there, the letter carrier out there. And while they may not see us in the plants and the processing centers, they know something's getting their package in their letters from one side of the country to the other, or one side of the town to the other. It was a 91% approval rate. But here's what's really wonderful, I think. It was an equal support amongst those who identified as Republicans and those who identified as Democrats and those who identified as independent. What does that tell us? It tells us that the sentiment of the country is strong. We also had a bipartisan, robust ask from the Postal Board of Governors setting policy, a Republican majority Postal Board of Governors asking for real financial relief from Congress. And we know we have people on both sides of the aisle that have also done the same. We have to make sure they have the fortitude this round to see it through. We've also done a number of polls that show that the vast majority of people in the country believe there should be real relief, not loans, but real COVID relief to the Postal Service and a majority of a lot of the people in the country, and even most of the Republicans, believe that this is an issue, that if the post office is not taken care of, that they will, they will be going to the polls and voting on and judging candidates for all levels of office in this country. So what that tells us is 
brothers and sisters, and we'll talk more about it later. We're going to win this fight because we're on the side of the people and the people are on the side of postal workers and the public postal service. So with that, uh, Jocelyn, I would like to uh, see if there's some questions. So again, people aren't just listening to me, but uh, I'm able to listen to, the, to, the, to, to our members out there and, and our friends. And, um, and then after a few questions, we'll uh, ask Brother Van Zimmerman to give us uh, uh, some update on the health and safety plan. So do we have any questions, John? We do, President. Uh, so we know that the union has been warning about privatization for years. What makes this different than other times? That's a very interesting question. So you are absolutely right. In, in fact, I mean, the, the, the questioner uh, is absolutely right. In fact, we formed the Grand Alliance to save our public postal service before this current administration was in office. There's been, we had the fight against Staples. Uh, which was an, an effort at privatization of retail. Uh, and we fought back and won with, with many allies, the other postal unions, the AFL-CIO, uh, civil rights groups, religious groups, community groups, and so on. So, it, and, it, and it goes way back. You, you, years and years ago, they tried to put post offices in Sears and we fought that back. You can imagine what would have happened if your local post office was in Sears. So just, Sears is gone but the post office is still there. What makes it different now is two things. We actually have an administration. You don't have to take my word for it. I'm not throwing off on any individual or any political party. It's a reality and we have to deal with it as workers. We have a situation where this administration on June, 2018, put into writing through an office, it's called the White House Office of Management and Budget. So this is the view of the White House that the post office should be privatized, should be broken up and sold to private corporations. And that that's their goal. And they also said this, this is their opportunity. An opportunity, an opportunity for who? For a few private corporations to rob the public till, the public cash register, something that belongs to the people. But postal service takes in $70 billion a year. And it also is the low cost anchor in this industry. So the private package delivery folks, they can't raise their prices, but so much as long as the post office is there. So one difference is we have an administration that for the first time in modern history wants to break, wants to wholesale privatize the entire operation. Staples was an effort at piecemeal privatization. Never has, have we faced an administration, and obviously there's a lot of power there and there's a lot of money there that wants to break up and sell off the entire postal service. And then you add to that the new ingredient of this economic crisis, the dire financial situation it's causing with postal, with the mail and therefore postal revenue. And the fact that revenue will no longer enable without some appropriated relief from Congress to carry out its mission. And that's giving those who want to privatize, who those who have put it on paper and said, these are our plans, a chance to now move into the kill. Uh, so those are two very different, different factors uh, that we haven't faced in the past. The general thrust of, of partial privatization we have been fighting for years. Uh, and, it's, and it's definitely a problem out there, but it has accelerated, it has intensified. And now we are truly at a fork in the road. So I, I definitely appreciate that question from, from uh, one of the participants here. So uh, another question, you mentioned the pre-funding requirement. Your members and the public know about that. Why can't Congress just fix that right now? Well, Congress was in the middle of trying to fix it. Uh, it doesn't put a lot of cash in the post office, but it takes a lot of pressure off of the post office. Uh, uh, the House had passed, and Judy can clarify if need be, I think in early January, uh, the House of Representatives on a bipartisan basis, half the Republican caucus voted to do away with the pre-funding mandate as being onerous, draconian, and unfair. And so that passed overwhelmingly. I think it was some 306, 309 votes. It was beginning to move through the Senate when this crisis hit and moved through the Senate on a bipartisan basis. So in a sense, that issue has been pushed down the road because the obstacle right now 
is the immediate obstacle is the impact of the COVID economic crisis. The longer run obstacles such as the pre-funding mandate and some other issues that do have to be uh, fixed, do have to be, you know, for instance, the post office should do a lot more services and which, 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 would, which would, would serve the customers better, bring in some revenue and so on and so forth. Those things have been pushed down the road because right now we have to survive through this uh, crisis. It should have been fixed a long time ago, Jocelyn. Uh, and for the uh, listener that asked, this law was passed in 2006. There have been many opportunities to have it done. We were finally making serious progress uh, on this. And in a sense, this pandemic has stopped it in its tracks for the moment. As soon as we can get through this period and we got to get the relief, we hope to get back to that issue, get that fixed. And that will give us a better playing field to address some of the other issues. As long as that's in the way, and it was a manufactured crisis by Congress in 2006, as long as that's there, that's gonna be a serious problem. But right now we have to get through this crisis. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. So do you wanna send things over to Vance or do you? I, 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 I will, how long have we taken? Sure. I would uh, let, let, let me do this. And then if we have some more questions, we, we can certainly come back. Nance Zimmerman, as I said earlier, is our industrial relations director. As part of that elected uh, position, he uh, oversees, is responsible for, uh, uh, leads the work on the national safety program of the APW. He jumped on this early. We were meeting with management. He was as early as January before COVID-19 was in most of our uh, consciousness uh, and we've done everything we know how to do. There's always ways to do more, but we've done everything we know how to do with a lot of give and take from all of you, uh, uh, all of you around the country, rank and file members, workers, your local leaders uh, have a lot of input, a lot of good ideas. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of the work that uh, Vance has done. So Vance, why don't you take it away? Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and I'm just so proud of our members and how they're there representing the American people, getting them their medicine, getting them there to work. I actually was at a post office this morning and just how much is needed. I'm very proud of, to be and honored to be your industrial relations director and assisting you to be safe for this pandemic. I just wanted to talk on a few things that, that we're, we've been doing. As Mark said, we started early in January with demands as we've seen this coming up because you deserve a safe workplace and you should demand that safe workplace. We're doing everything we can to give you the um, tools to get that done. Uh, we started meetings early. We demanded PPE to be in place. Uh, we had demanded additional cleaning protocols, which the Postal Service has done and supposed to be doing. We do have a website related on our website, COVID-19 related all the MOUs that, that's been signed are on there. Uh, we demanded regular communications with the unions at every level, at the district level, at the local level, at the area level, and the headquarters level, and those can on a weekly basis. Uh, we demanded that there was some kind of protection for our retail clerks to the public, sneeze guards. Um, as the end of May, every retail unit should have uh, plexiglass in it. Um, and then we discussed what I think the APW is proudest is the liberal lead policy that gives you the right, if you're affected by COVID-19, to take off on leave and not be disciplined for it, whether you have an underlying condition, whether you have a child care issue. Uh, so that's in place and that continues to be in place. We set up several protocols and meetings to make sure where areas where, where there wasn't PPE, to make sure that happened. And We've signed numerous MOUs that have now all been expended to May 25th. Uh, Mark and I will be meeting with management about extending those, such as telework where possible, additional leave to stay at home when sick and exposed, or additional dependent care leave, additional leave for our PSEs. Uh, we are involved in closing down the NCCD so that that travel, you got grievance extensions, your local MOU negotiations extensions, we got protections for the probation employees that they have to take off due to COVID-19. And we then got additional supplemental work agreed to a memorandum that allowed for the liberal leave policy so that you can take off. 
Um, the law is now in place under the FFCRA. It gives you more time off for the liberal lead policy. We continue to meet with management on that um, around childcare issues. And there's an expanded FMLA under the FFCRA that deals with childcare um, and taking off in two thirds. And I just wanna say, it's, it, I'm very proud that we've got together, worked together as a union, a strong union, showing a support and getting the public what they need. Um, and, you know, you've got a 1767 if they're not following the procedure. You've got stewards. If they're not following the procedure, contact your stewards. And together, we'll continue to deliver the mail, get them to the public, and sir, make them understand how important we are. And I mean, that's one of the, there's always a, a, a shining moment in, in tragic times like this, which is right now, the public's understanding the communication and how important the post office is. And every one of you on the front line are making that happen. And I, we, we can't salute you enough. Uh, Mark made mention I may not be getting much sleep, but I'm proud to be up every moment trying a way to give you the tools to keep doing your job. Um, so I just want to put a big thank you out there for everybody at every level, what you're doing. And with that, uh, I think we can take a few more questions. Thank you, Vince. Hold on one, one second, guys. So uh, could you tell us a little bit more, Vance, about uh, those protection measures for the post office workers? So the, the post office is a federal agency. One of the agreements we've got that any state, state or local recommendation or requirement that the post office will file, follow. For, so for example, if they're required to wear a mask in the state, then they're required to wear a mask at the post office. If they put a, a testing in place uh, for temperature taking or whatever is put in place by governors that's required, the post office has agreed to follow those. The fact that we got additional 80 hours of, of leave for the PSEs. So when you look at the retail units, you'll see that the, there, there should be signs posted that people are supposed to be six foot away. The additional cleaning, the, everybody should have masks, everybody should have disinfectant. Uh, that should be readily available. Every social distancing should be happening. Uh, for instance, there's a machine called a pass machine. And that machine uh, on crunch time in the morning, usually people are very close together. There's a specific layout of how that has to be set up. They set things up called bullpens, which doesn't mean a lot except for postal workers. Those are areas where a lot of times people are very close together. They set up multiple bullpens in these processing centers to keep people apart. So social distancing should be happening at the workplace and where it's not possible, masks are required. Uh, so there's been cleaning protocols and set up for all three crafts, MBS, maintenance, support services, and the clerk craft. Um, so, and I, I just want to uh, point out something Mark said earlier. A lot of the great ideals have come up from the field saying, what, what about this? What about that? And we looked at them and where we could get them implemented, we've listened. So I wanna, uh, we can talk a lot about a lot of things that we've got done at headquarters, but I wanna emphasize the important role that the people on the, in the field have played in, in making these safe things. Thanks so much, Vance. Uh, so we have a question from Pamela. Some people are saying that liberal lead policy is no longer necessary. What would you say to that? I say that COVID-19 is still an effect. We're gonna be dealing with it for a long time. A person's right to be safe is the most important thing. If, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And, and it's very important that we need to give the people the tools to take care of themselves. They shouldn't be deciding between their paycheck and their health. And with a liberal leave policy where they can use their leave or use the different types of leave that's available and still earn a paycheck and not be disciplined is at the heart of what we believe. Nobody should have to fear of losing their job because they're concerned with safety or taking care of their kids. And we'll continue to push to make that happen as long as we're in this pandemic. Agreed. 
And uh, circling back to that, for retail workers who are at high risk, how can they get plastic face masks? They, they should have dust masks. They should have plexiglass should be between them and the workers. Um, okay. If not, they should be asking for a steward. They should be, even they got the plexiglass up, they should be having masks. If they happen to have an underlying health condition where they can't wear a mask, then they should, our workers, not just in retail, all our workers, if they can't wear a mask because they have an underlying health condition, they, they should have right access to a face shield. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, one more question. Management isn't following the maintenance orders to clean a facility enough. What can people do? What can workers do? Uh, so a 1767 is a form that any safety violation that gets filled out, you can fill that out, record that, give it to management, you get a copy back or required to act on that. Um, that should be done. If the cleaning isn't being done, we, we're entitled to a safe work environment. You should be filling out those 1767s. That gives a record. It actually gets recorded and up the line, they can see if that's being done. Uh, and then once you fill that 1767 out, you should ask to talk to your steward. Awesome. So the local union can enforce that. Yeah, and I, I, I love everything you're bringing. You're right. People absolutely need to feel like there's a channel of accountability for that. You know, people can't work in these conditions. So, it's, if, if I can ask you to just, Follow up with that question on the internal procedures you've established from the local to the region to you when there are problems that so the, actually the worker in the workroom floor has a method to also bring that all the way up the line to your attention at headquarters. Sure, Mark. Um, so we set up a, an internal protocol where the a local member if the can go to the steward with sewer will talk to the local president. If the local president can't get it resolved at the district. They can contact the national business agent. The national business agent will try to get that resolved. Uh, if the national business agent's not able to get that resolved, uh, they'll contact the regional coordinators. And if the regional coordinators can't get it resolved with the area, then uh, it's funneled up to me. Uh, every morning I meet with management on, on COVID-19 issues. So a uh, question for Mark. Just how can people get involved to support the legislation moving forward um, around this? Great question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer some of it, and then that would be a good time to uh, pass the baton to our legislative and political director. There's a number, number of ways. Number one, we need everybody. We need all your coworkers. We need your family. We need your friends. We need your neighbors. We need your, the people you go to your faith-based organization with, even if you can't go in person, you know them, your community organizations. To call Congress, particularly on the Senate side, Republicans, Democrats, urban and rural and everywhere in between. That the post office, what the post office means to you, what it means to this country, and that financial relief is in order based on this COVID pandemic. Now, we also have petitions, and you can go to the APWU website for the information on contacting your uh, Congress people. We have petitions, uh, over a million signatures are ready, so those can be spread, gotten in, off the website as well. USMailNotForSale.org is another good website with this information. It says it all, doesn't it? USMailNotForSale.org. Uh, and you can not only sign those petitions, but if everybody on this call got 10 or 20 other people, sorry, it's not a call. I know I have to get used to the new technology. It is Facebook Live. Um, the, um, just think if you got 10 or 20 other people, everybody in your family, and ask them to spread it through their Facebook and their emails and their Twitter accounts. Um, and the other thing is we, we all have something to say. We've been, some of us are newer postal workers. Some of us are retired postal workers. Some of us have been there a long time. We all do all different types of work. But a simple op-ed, a simple letter to the editor spreads the word about what's going on and the message should all, can always be, and we hope will be, that the post office needs relief because of how important it is and this epidemic is having this kind of impact. So those are um, some of the ways that people can get involved. And in a sense, we have to talk to each other. 
uh, we're, we're, we're very proud we accomplished a good contract. We're proud that there's going to be retroactive pay. We're going to get it in your hands as soon as we can. It looks like I said, the end of August, early September. But if we don't have a post office in October or November, that retroactive pay is only going to go so far, right? So we want both. And so we have to impress upon our coworkers. You're more involved, you got on this call. You're, you're, you're spending an hour or so with us and together. But we have to impress upon the coworkers that this is really a battle. There's a fork in the road and we have powerful forces aligned against us. But we the people can win. And if we're united and organized, we will prevail. But so even just talking to your coworkers, talking to your family members, talking to your neighbors and friends is very important. So with that, if it's okay, Jocelyn, even if there's some other questions, we, we, we can come back to them. I'd like to turn it over to our, because that question is a good segue, uh, turn it over to uh, Sister Judy Beard, our hardworking dynamite legislative and political director, to give you a little update on where things are at with Congress right now uh, and what some of those timetables look like uh, and what are some of the, and to reemphasize uh, some of the things that we can do, because I'm sure I haven't touched on everything or haven't gotten into depth on all of those things. Judy. Uh, thank you, President Demistein, and hello to everyone. You know, before I, I um, make presentations, and I've been making quite a few lately, I always say, no rain, no snow, no COVID-19 can stop postal workers from performing their service to the American people. You are great. You are appreciated by the public, and I thank you. In a democracy, the more people that are involved, the more of our citizens that are involved, the more they influence our lawmakers. And our lawmakers right now are working on several, uh, they were working on several stimulus bills since early March. The first one was signed into law on March 6th. The second one was signed in a couple weeks later. That was the Family First and the Preparedness Act. And as you know, uh, the family first included language for postal workers to receive two weeks sick leave and some childcare. However, it did not give the postal service any reimbursement for giving you that leave as they uh, other companies got. So that was totally unfair unfair to the post office, unfair to the workers. Then there was that CARES Act and the CARES and the Paycheck Protection. Those also did not treat us as postal workers fairly. To have a loan that you have to pay back and corporations was getting billions of dollars that they did not have to pay back was unfair. So over the last couple of months, I've been meeting with members of Congress, along with the other three postal unions, to try to get some strong language in the law for postal workers. And unfortunately, we have not been able to do that as of now. However, when we fight together, we win. So with each passing day, we get more and more pe people on our side. You've heard about it on the news. You've heard, read it in the newspaper. People are coming up to us saying, how can we help? Well, just yesterday, the House of Representatives released another stimulus packet. It's called the Health and Economy Recovery and Omnibus Emergency Solutions Heroes Act. Now that's a lot of words. And it's a big act. It's over 1,800 pages. It was just released yesterday. So you're probably wondering, well, what's in it for, for us? Well, you've made a lot of phone calls and you've done a lot of letter writing 
and you've gone to town hall meetings on the web page and you've gotten to members of the house on both sides of the aisle and we are in that packet postal workers 25 billion dollars for the post office to help with COVID related uh things uh it's in that packet the the loan that was in the ability to borrow money that was in the last stimulus act that we complained about quite a bit because it had strings attached to it it wasn't just you had the ability to borrow the money 10 billion dollars but we had to uh, also go through the secretary of treasurer to get it and that the secretary of treasurer could come up with rules that are totally unreasonable uh maybe uh reduce the days that mail is delivered or uh, in addition to that it could be uh maybe get rid of the union for negotiating benefits so in this stimulus package they want to repeal that language take it back you know allow the postal service to borrow money without strings attached to it now i know i've been getting calls at our office and we have a system set up not only for calls but we have a system set up for mail too and i've been getting inquiries on you know we've heard things about a heroes act are we going to be treated like other workers well in this bill postal workers are included in the heroes act for funds and now those funds are um, 13 dollars an hour from the period of january 27th through 60 days after this emergency COVID uh, is ended. So January um, 27th, and then through 60 days after COVID-19 has ended, and um, up to, it's a cap on it. And that cap is uh, $10,000 for those that earn under $200,000 a year. So that's in the, the bill that they're currently uh, still debating, uh, still talking about it, is in draft form. It hasn't been approved by the House yet. Uh, once it's approved by the House, and it could change, once it's, it uh, is approved by the House, then it'll go over to the Senate. So just like President Demistein is urging you to contact your senator, I am also urging you to contact your senators like more than once. We have a toll free number that's on the legislative hotline, and it's 844 402 1001. That's 844 402 one zero zero one and there are senators on both sides of the aisle that does not want the postal service to close up we just have to keep reminding them that if that's how you feel because you've read the tweets you've also uh went on facebook and saw what they said on facebook you have to remind them of what they said and say, if you really believe those words, you will make sure leadership, you will make sure McConnell and Schumer will approve a stimulus bill that will include the post office, include the heroes pay, include uh, the $25 billion. Uh, and, and it should be at least 25 billion, it could be more. So it's important that you start once again, because I know you're doing it now, start writing Congress, start doing op-eds, start sharing the information with your friends as well. And if you call our hotline, 
we made it easy for you. President Devastine will come on that hotline and repeat what's needed to be done. So you don't have to write it down. And then you put in your zip code and you will be switched to your senator. And then you call back again and you get switched to the second senator. So it's important that regardless of what party you belong to, don't just call the party that you belong to, call both of your senators and tell them how important this is, not just to postal workers, but to the American people as well. Thank you, Thank you so much, Judy. And before we uh, uh, move on, Jocelyn, do we have some uh, questions for our sister Judy Beard, our legislative and political director? I do, Judy, although you kind of hit on it already. Just a question from Chuck. What can we do at the local level to make sure the $25 billion proposed by the House gets into the Senate bill and gets passed into law? So it is so important that you let your members of Congress know that you vote and that you're watching what they do because often they think that, you know, we're busy watching TV or we're busy with our children and we're not watching what they do, but let them know you're going to watch how they vote. And, and when you watch how they vote and if they're not voting correct, you, you let them know too that you are a voter. You will be voting in the November election. And just let them know how important this is, not just to the worker, but to the American people. Thanks, thanks, Judy. And also, uh, Jocelyn, if I can add, we, we are in the process of planning. We'll have to let you all know. Keep an eye on the website and the Facebook, some caravans uh, where we may caravan to some Senate offices. This is unfortunately a, a new day. I hope it's not a new normal, but we can't go visit senators and Congress people. We can't congregate in groups of sometimes more than one other person, but we can gather in our cars. We can have signs. We can have virtual news conferences. So those things also may be coming soon at the local level. There have been some of those events in different parts of the country, and they have they, they it's a very good way of bringing bringing attention to our uh, issues. So uh, one more question for Judy, if that's okay. Absolutely. Marilyn, uh, Marilyn says that vote by mail should happen uh, nationwide. Is that possible? A vote by mail system. Um. Did we lose Judy? Oh, you, I'm sorry. You, you, sorry. <laughs> there you I'm go. back. There you go. Uh, uh, in we, this, we, we wouldn't want to lose your sister, believe me. <laughs> in some um, legislation that the, the House is currently discussing, um, there is a vote by mail um, clause in it. And that vote by mail is to allow anybody in the country who wants an absentee ballot to be able to get one without um, a state putting strings attached to it. You know, some states would like to put something attached to it, like, you know, you still have to take a picture of your ID and, and include it and put it in, in the envelope, or you need a signature of a witness that that was you voting. Uh, that's all included. That, that should not happen in this, in this bill that you should, anybody should have the right to have an absentee ballot in the whole country. And in addition, once you request a, a absentee ballot, uh, that you never have to request one again, you will automatically get one. So that's in the draft of this new bill. Now the things I have said that is in the draft of the bill, uh, hopefully will stay in the bill. But as I said, the House is right now uh, looking at these 1,800 pages. Uh, they may add some, they may subtract some language, but eventually they're gonna vote. The House will vote. We will let you know the exact language that they vote on in this bill. And then that bill will go over to the Senate. And thank you for asking that question. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Judy. Uh, I really, I, I've learned a lot from all you guys. So uh, President Dimenstein, do you want to add to any of that? Sure. Let, let, let me add this. Uh, I know a lot of questions have come in and we can't answer them all. I'm going to assume a question came in and if not, I'm going to ask myself. 
Uh, what's the significance of the appointment of the new postmaster general? Uh, so a man named Mr. Louis DeJoy was just appointed by the Board of Governors as the new postmaster general. We put out a statement on the website uh, from me, but it was with a lot of conversation with a number of the top leaders. Uh, we were disturbed by a few things. Number one, you know, 50 years ago, we had the great historic postal strike, unlawful, victorious, changed the foundation of our relationship with the post office, brought in collective bargaining rights, uplifted postal workers for generations to come in terms of the wages, and benefits, and rights. But along with that strike came the, the formation of what some people call the modern post office, 1970 Postal Reorganization Act. Took it from a post office department that was very politicized. The postmaster was appointed directly by the president. There was a a lot of political, uh, uh, there's a lot of cronyism in terms of who, who got hired, who got appointments, who got promotions. And it, one of the goals of the modern post office, the Postal Reorganization Act, was to do away with the cronyism and the patronage of the old system. And here we are 50 years later that the new postmaster general, certainly on the surface, uh, got the job because they are a huge donor, a mega donor to this administration. And that would certainly be, and I think is a uh, troubling uh, issue. Uh, having said that, what we said in our statement is, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving anybody the benefit of the doubt right now. Uh, I want a postmaster general who believes in the public mission. I just don't want it. We presented 400,000 signatures earlier in the year to the Postal Board of Governors that the people were demanding postmaster general who believes in the public mission of binding the country together and doing it with public service, public jobs, uh, the, the, and public ownership. And so I'm not convinced we have that and someone's going to have to convince us. We've come too far uh, to roll over. And our concern is of whether Mr. Louis DeJoy uh, and we're concerned on whether he's going to bring joy uh, to the postal workers and to the postal patrons, and everybody's a postal customer in this country, or whether he's going to try to bring the destructive policies of raising rates, reducing service, and attacking workers' rights and benefits, uh, the policies of this administration into the post office. Uh, and if he does, what we said in our statement, and we believe it, is the people of this country will will resist. We don't think the people of the country are going to allow somebody to steal what belongs to them. If, however, he's true to some of his uh, words that he's made since he got the appointment, uh, and the words sound good, but I'm a believer like most of you are, is by thy deeds we shall know them. Uh, if his deeds prove to be what he's saying, and then at some point he may become a welcome uh, member of the postal family. I, um, I will point out that he made his millions, multi-millions on subcontracting work that postal workers used to do with unionized job conditions with decent pay and benefits. And those jobs were subcontracted years ago. The new breed leasing company that he founded and headed up uh, made millions and millions of dollars off of that a multi-decade country. Uh, and so that's a worrisome issue as well. So we will have to see. We've always said this is going to be a struggle. Uh, it is a struggle. And as Mo Biller, our former president of 21 years, uh, always used to say, and he's absolutely right, the struggle continues. And so it does it. And so it does with Mr. Louis DeJoy's appointment. It also continued with previous postmasters generals. So the goals of the union don't change. Decent wages and benefits, decent retirement in our retirement years, good job opportunities for the coming generations, health and safety, social justice for all workers in the 99%. Those don't change as postmasters come and go. The moment of the struggle may, uh, we are definitely in a struggle, but I just did what I did want to mention a little bit about the appointment of the new PMG, and I'm sure it's on uh, the 
minds of the uh, listeners and certainly on the minds uh, of our members. If you haven't read our statement, uh, it's on the website. Uh, and we, we, we just have to be armed. We can't pretend, sisters and brothers. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say, Mr. DeJoy, we, we love you. You're the new PMG, uh, and we look forward to working with you. We look forward to working with you. If you prove to us you believe in this public institution and the public commons and the mission that it stands for. And if you don't, we don't look forward to working with you. And you will be hearing from not just our union, but the workers we represent and the people of this country. So he has a choice to make. Uh, we certainly hope it's the right choice, uh, but we are certainly ready for the worst if that's what comes. So, and, and th were there any more questions, Jocelyn, or I answered well, my own question, what can I say? <laughs> First of all, I, wa I wanna thank all of you and to all of our viewers, please share, share this, uh, get engaged. Uh, please, please, please address your members of Congress and senators. But one more time, uh, President Dimenstein, is there, as before we close out, just like to recap the ways people can support the, the Postal Service? Okay, we can sign petitions, we can write uh, letters <laughs> to the editor, we can talk to our family, our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, everybody we know. We can sign petitions, we can get those emails, letters, uh, calls into Congress. If we get some caravans, come and get out in your cars. But the main message I want to leave people with is this. We can win this fight and we will win this fight because the people of the country on a nonpartisan basis from left to right, center, right to left and center, people believe in, trust and need the post office and needed to be a public institution that serves everybody equally, every address, again, no matter who we are, where we live with a universal service mandate. If we allow this institution to be sold off and broken up. But the people of this country will get will depend on whether somebody can make a quick buck, which means a lot of us won't get services, or if we do get services, there will be less, or the cost will be much more. We have a president of the United States who's saying for the post office to get relief, they have to raise package rates four and five times. You're all out there in the front lines. You know what packages mean to the postal service now. You know that's been an area of growth and a bright spot in this e-commerce revolution and how important the e-commerce and small business and the individuals the postal service is. If, if rates are raised, post office will be driven out of the package business. If the post office is driven out of the package business, you all know what's going to happen to the postal service. But the people of the country, individuals, small business, even some large businesses, the unions, and even many in postal management are united in the effort to protect, save, and enhance and expand this wonderful uh, national treasure of ours. So I just want to leave people that we won the Staples fight. We won many fights along the way. We want to fight for a decent contract and a decent standard of living. We can win this fight because we're together and the people will always be able to beat if we're united. And if we're mobilized and organized, however much money, Wall Street money and power, those who want to privatize the post office, sad because the people will prove to be stronger. We're going to keep what's ours. We look forward to working with all of you. We, we really appreciate everybody taking a little time tonight. And we would like some feedback. This is the first time we've ever done this as a union leadership. Did it work? You like it? You want to do it some more? Did you hate it? Let us know. And, uh, and we're always looking for ways to communicate with the members and to hear from the members. And we're glad we were able to hear some of your questions tonight as, as well. So let's stay in touch. Uh, let's row together, fight together. That's what a union's about. And, and we unite so many people from so many different viewpoints around our common interests, job security, a decent life for our families and the public commons and the public good in this case called the United States Postal Service. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. I really appreciate Brother Zimmerman and Sister Beard uh, joining me tonight and all of you joining the call. Thank you so much, President Dimonstein, and thank you so much to our viewers. I know I learned a lot. Everybody call your members of Congress and stay involved.
Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great evening, Thank you guys. You.